Today we're going to be looking at intersection site distance. And we've gone through in the previous lectures uh, how to design at grade intersections. And we looked at the, uh, the vertical alignments uh, for that most recently and how to do both signalized and stop controlled uh, intersections and how we line those up through there and also different styles of intersections. We looked at auxiliary lanes where we're going to need left and right turn uh, additional lanes to improve traffic flow and safety. At intersections, the last thing we need to check, um, mostly for safety, is intersection site distance. Intersection, so at, at a normal intersection, we've got a minor and a major road. So here would be our minor road over here, and here's the major road uh, coming across there, right through that. We've, in the Ashto Green Book, if you go through that chapter, you'll see that there's a number of different scenarios that they lay out, and they call them cases. Uh, through there, and they all work on a site triangle. So the site triangle is how much unobstructed uh, area you need uh, to be able to see the car on the main road or the major road to the car on the minor road over here. And so everything here in this cross-hatched area has to be clear of obstructions. So starting back here at this decision point, and this would be a case for an uncontrolled intersection or yield uh, coming up there, up to the car on the main line, they need to be able to see each other. And it's mostly the car on the main, the minor road, being able to see the car on the major road, but they should, especially in this case, be able to see each other <clears throat> as they come closer. So this whole area has to be open to view, right? There can't be a hill in here, there can't be a building in here, there can't be trees or shrubs within that site triangle. And um, Based on, you'll see how the equations work later, but based on uh, what your approach speeds are and what you're doing, it depends on how big this site uh, triangle needs to be in that clear site triangle right through there. So we've got two different kinds of triangles. We've got an approach site triangle, and that's, that's what we were just looking at. That allows for drivers on both the major and that minor road to be able to see each other as they approach the intersection and avoid a potential uh, uh, collision from that. All right. The decision point is the the point at which the drivers on the minor road uh, need to make their decision. What are they going to do? Are they going to stop or are they going to go? All right. And that's uh, if we look back on this diagram, this decision points back here. Right. And so we our calculations are based on we give this driver enough time to make the proper decision to make a safe decision. So there's some time put in there for uh, actually being able to see. Um, and and come to a stop if they need to, but also some time for them to think about, uh, can I make it or can I, I not, right? So they're doing some reasoning, and, they're, and we've talked about this before with the stopping site distance and the braking, right? There's a reaction time. So that's built into this distance that we need. And based on the speed on this minor road approach, it's how far back we need to see so that they can see what the situation is, make a decision, and then safely control the vehicle to a stop if they need to at that at that point. So that decision point is that piece on the minor road as you're coming up to the intersection uh, through there. So this is a, a case where we've got our approach site triangles. This is an uncontrolled or yield controlled uh, intersection through that. Yeah, you know, we don't use yield control very often anymore in the U.S. It's almost always stop controlled at the major road. But this is case A. This is the first case in the green book that we go through so you can see. And the point here is that we have to look both directions, right? So here's an approach, a car coming in from the left. Here's a car coming in from the right, okay? And we have a decision point. And our decision point is measured in this case. Uh, you can see for this uh, car approaching from the minor road, it's up to the center of the path of the vehicle approaching. Right? And in this case, it's in that right lane as it approaches, or the near lane to this vehicle. If, you're, if a vehicle is approaching from the right side, uh, in this case, coming up here, we're measuring that, uh, that distance that we need, that decision distance for the site triangle, again, to the center of the path of the vehicle through there. In this case, it's on the far lane. So you can see the difference here. It may not be obvious when you first see these, but that's what we're measuring to. And because that's where this vehicle would conflict with that one. And so we measure to that point. This is where those two would come into contact. At least their centers of gravity would uh, through there. So that's, that's what we're measuring to in both those cases. Right. So we had that approach site triangle. We also have a departure site triangle, and this is going to be the more common one that you're going to be checking for. And it's that the driver in the 
uh, in the approach site triangle, the car hasn't stopped yet. In the departure site triangle, the car has come to a stop, and here it is, right, on the minor road. Uh, and we're assuming that the major road, because it's the major road, doesn't have to stop in these situations. Now, there is a, a case in the green book that you can check for that's a, for four-way stops, but um, almost all of them you're going to be checking for are not a four-way stop. And so we're going to assume this major road vehicle is not going to stop. So the decision point is always on the minor road. And for a departure start triangle, it's this minor road vehicle has stopped and it's about to go again. So... The approach site triangle back here was, do I need to stop or not? Well, let's say there was a car, so I had to stop. Now, before I can go again, I need to be able to see this triangle. This is a departure site triangle, and it's smaller. You don't need to be able to see as far. Again, it's being measured out to the center of the travel path of the approaching vehicle. So then you can see it a little bit different here. This one's on the far side lane. This one's to the near side lane through that. So that's what we're looking at here is this is if you're departing from that the stopping point, I, I wouldn't call it decision point at this point, you've come to a stop. As you're departing from that point, what's um, what do you need to be able to see? What clear area do you, do you need to have? What's here? So here's our sight triangle for the cars approaching from the left. Here's the sight triangle for cars approaching from the right yeah, through that. And you'll notice this this distance B is the same. Right, any both directions uh, in this in this model. Now that's for a, a car approaching from the right. We're going to see that um, this B term is actually uh, changing right through there, and so does this A uh, piece through that. So even though they're labeled the same, they aren't necessarily the same distance. All right, so keep that in mind as we work through. Don't let the graph uh, throw you off there. So the, the lengths of the sides of that site triangle depend on the speed of the intersecting roads and also what kind of traffic controls the intersection. So whether it's a yield or a stop sign. And in this case, if this was stops here on the minor road and none on the major road, we call that a two-way stop. The two ways being on the minor road, right? If everybody has to stop, it's a four-way stop or an all-way all -way stop. And I guess that's the preferred terminology through it. Or this could be a yield controlled, and so this minor road would have the yield signs. Again, not very common anymore in the U.S., but uh, you may come across it in smaller subdivisions or in uh, rural areas. They still sometimes use yield control. Uh, through there, there actually is a case, case A, which is no control at an intersection. Or you may not think that's that common, but there, yeah, there it is. The um, county I used to work for in subdivisions didn't allow any any uh, traffic control signs to be put up in subdivisions, so they were all an uncontrolled intersection, and so they would be covered by case A uh, through there. And it's uh, surprisingly had very few problems with that that uh, philosophy um, in legislation that they didn't put signs up inside subdivisions. And because most of your speeds are low, it's 20, 25 miles per hour usually in, in subdivisions. Well, of course, someone's always speeding. Um, but there, the traffic is tends to be so light, and it's all local people, so they would know... Um, uh, which road is the major road may give way just based on that uh, to other vehicles. There's very few accidents. It, it rarely came up. I think in the 10 years I was there, we only had really one that ever popped up because there was no control at all at the intersection uh, through there. So that does happen. Um, that was a rarity. and I'd never seen that before until I was in Dakota County. Uh, through there. Case B is the, is the one we're going to look at the most. It's stop control on the minor road. Then C is yield. Case D is if you have traffic signals. Case E is always stop. And then finally case F is looking at left turns off the major road. Now that one also we, we look at quite often. And you know, we'll find out that 95% of the stuff we look at is going to be this case B, stop control on the minor road uh, through that. So we're going to spend most of our time today on that. Right? <clears throat> case A, that no control means there are no signs telling people who has the right of way and by by law by uh, federal law it's the the car if they're approaching at exactly the same time the car on the right the car to your right has the right of way uh, through there so just keep that in mind and not sure if you remember that from your driver's ed class i know i didn't <laughs> right through there and so you can there are charts, there's tables here to calculate how much stopping or distance you need uh, approaching the approach triangles and departure triangles for those cases. In case A, we're not going to spend much time on it, just in the interest of time to keep moving here through there. They exist. You, so if you ever run across this situation, you'll know where to find it. 
Again, most of our cases are going to be this case B where we have stop control on the minor road. And so every vehicle approaching on that minor road has to stop. And we want to, and we're not worried about an approach site uh, triangle at that point because knowing that the minor road has to stop, all we really check for is that they ha they can see the sign, the stop sign, uh, early enough to safely stop. And so that's really the only thing we're worried about on the approach. So everything for this case B is a departure site triangle. Once the car has come to a stop, can they see well enough uh, to get across the road or turn onto the road? And so you'll see we've, we break case B into three subcases, B1, B2, and B3, which is a car is approaching you from the left, or I'm sorry, you want to turn left onto the major road, you want to turn right onto the major road, or you want to get across the major road. All right, and so that's what the three cases uh, are going to be for that. And they're all a little bit different as we look for it. So here's um, case B. This is our stop control. So you come to a stop here, and this is as your car is parked and you're looking both directions. And in this case, you're turning left onto the roadway. So this is case B1. And do you have enough sight distance both to the left and to the right to safely pull out, cross the first lane, and merge into traffic in the far lane? in a two-way, oh, this is a two-lane road situation. And we'll see, we have to adjust this for multi-lane roads and so forth on, but this is the our basic uh, setup for this case B1. You're turning left onto the major road. All right, so first question, how far is that driver's eye from the edge of the through lane? All right, so here's our through lane. If we drew a line across, straight across here, how far back does the driver sit? How far back would your head and your eyes be from the edge of this travel lane? That's what we're gonna measure everything from. Right, so think about you know how much you know about cars and whatnot, and maybe you want a little bit of shy distance. You don't want to nose your car to be right on the edge. That's not safe, right? You're going to stop a little bit in advance of that, All right? So it turns out to be 14 and a half feet, and so that's this distance here in the red is 14 and a half feet. That's the minimum. Ashto says you should use a little more if you can, if you've got it, but uh, 14 and a half is what the minimum is, and that's what we. That's how we would normally draw our sight uh, triangles for that. So that's the vertex point right through that. And then that allows for you know the hood of your car plus some distance from between the front bumper and the edge of the road, the crossroad there on the major road uh, through that. If you've got the space, uh, Astro recommends you go up to 18 feet to give yourself a little more space through that. The height of both your eye and the object that's approaching from either side is set to be three and a half feet. And that's that gives you uh, that's for passenger cars. And that gives you a, a good view of another vehicle. And you saw, I think we saw the three and a half feet when we were doing um, um, passing sight distance on crest uh, vertical curves through there. So three and a half feet, you'll see the top portion of a car enough of it that it's obvious. And so we're using that three and a half feet for both the driver's eye and the object right through there. Stopping sight distance, remember, for a crest curve, we were looking at a two foot tall object uh, through there in a, in a sag curve. We're looking at the pavement, so it's a zero feet tall. Uh, through there, the sight distance, we're worried about other vehicles. And so we use three and a half and three and a half. And that's where we, that comes from. Right, through there, so this is the this is the main key uh, uh, table that we're going to use for this. And so, for a passenger car, it all comes down to this time gap. How much time do you need in a gap? How much space between vehicles is it going to take your car to move out into traffic and turn left, and to get into it? And what what uh, research has shown is that we have seven and a half seconds is, is enough time to safely make a decision and accelerate and get your car out into the lane and get going. All right. It takes longer if it's got a beer, bigger vehicle. All right. So if you're a single unit truck, straight truck, it's nine and a half seconds for combination. You're 11 and a half seconds. Right. And so that's, uh, you're going to see how we use those, these times and convert those into a distance, and that's how we measure, that's how we draw then or measure the departure site triangles that we need uh, through this. All right, so it's it all starts with time, so keep that in mind. We're actually, we base all this on the gap time that we need to safely do whichever maneuver right through here. And a couple things to point out. This is in your green book, um, but don't forget to read the notes down below here, right? So this is a classic exam question is I give you an odd situation. You've got to read these notes down here and adapt your uh, calculations to make, uh, 
to use that, right? So this is so these times or are for uh, across a two um, two lane highway. If you've got more than two lanes, you have to add a half second for every passenger car for each additional lane, or 0.7 seconds for a truck for each additional lane out there, right? So if you're crossing four lanes, you're going to have to add a full second on to this number. You have eight and a half seconds if you're crossing four lanes versus crossing two. All right, so that's how that works. And you'd add 1.4 seconds if it was a truck on the, either one of those two numbers. All right? It takes that much longer. And it, so it's a weird thing. Was we're adding seconds on for each lane. Well, well, what's an equivalent lane? Well, you know, most lanes are 12 feet. So that's, um, and you'll see when we get into multi-lane with medians, uh, we'll divide whatever that median gap is by 12. And that's how many additional lanes. And we add in extra time for each one of those um, theoretical extra lanes in the middle that you have to cross through. It adds in time. The other thing we have to adjust for is if we've got uh, grades, so if there's a, a steep grade um, that a car has to leave from, right? So this is the approach grade. This is the grade that the stopped car is sitting on. If that's if that ledge or the, the approach that that car is sitting on is greater than 3%, you have to add 0.2 seconds for each percent of grade uh, for left turn. All right. So if you're on a 2% approach uh, grade, you don't have to worry about it. You just use those numbers or maybe adapt them with the extra lanes, but you don't have to add any time in for extra grade. But if you're, uh, and this is, uh, uh, going uphill, if you, and that's usually how we design these minor road approaches, is they approach and they go up towards the new road. If you've got more than 3%, you're going to have to add extra time in because it's harder for your car to get started. And it takes longer for it to accelerate. And so the, the weird thing is, is that you don't, this point too, so if it was 4% uh, grade, right, how much time are you going to add? Are you going to add, you know, it's 1% over 3, so you're only going to add 0.2? Mm, nope, that's not what it says. It says you add 0.2 for each percent grade. So you're actually adding 0.8 seconds if you're at 4%, right? So that's a good tricky little thing that often catches people up. So keep that in mind uh, through that. All right, so you've got all these vehicles. Do you check all three? Are you going to check all three of these? Conservatively, yeah, you're going to check them all uh, through there. And in practice, no. The, the funny thing is, you know, this seven and a half seconds for a passenger car with a three and a half uh, foot height to eye, right? What's the height of the eye um, for a truck driver? Right? It's much higher. And so what it turns out is, is that, yeah, you need a bigger gap, but you automatically almost, if you check for passenger cars, um, you're going to be able to see farther from a truck. Uh, because it's, you know, you sit much higher there. And that almost makes up for, in practice, it tends to make up for that difference in time. And so you can feel pretty comfortable. If it works for a passenger car, you should feel fairly comfortable it works for these other two trucks, right? And so if you're an initial design and you're doing a quick check, just checking the passenger car is probably good enough, right? In in the end, like if you were working for INDOT, they will force you to check um, for the truck, situation as well. So you, usually you check for for a car and then for a combination truck because that'll cover the single unit truck in the middle through there. So this design, this uh, intersection site distance is a level one design criteria by INDOT rules, which means it's super important. And that uh, if you don't get your intersection site distance that you need, you're, you have to redesign your approach. Right? There's, you're not probably going to get an exception. Uh, for that. So because it's a level, because it's level one. If it was a level two or three, you might be able to get an exception level one, especially sight distance because it's safety related. Not likely at all that they're even going to talk to you about getting you an exception for that. Unless it's an absolute terrible situation and you're making it better and there's nothing more you can do. Uh, not sure what that situation would be. They might then, you know, give you an exception for it. But this is this is high level stuff. You're going to have to check for the passenger car and accommodation truck in the end. But just feel comfortable that if the passenger car works, it's pretty generally the other two trucks work uh, because you have you have a longer sight distance because they sit higher and they can see farther down the road, which makes up for this difference in time. Right through there. This is the equation then. So this from this table, let's say we needed seven and a half seconds to do our left turn from a stop. 
All right? We plug that seven and a half seconds in here is this TG in this equation times what's the speed on the major road, let's say it's 55 miles per hour, so 55 times 1.47, that's what our intersection site is, would be. All right? And that's, um, that's the, the leg of the triangle along the major road. So if we jump back here, that intersection site is that's this distance right here between the car and the point to where it would intersect your path uh, if you came straight across, right? Or it's this distance. And it's measured along the center of the lane, right? So if you have a curved approach, if this is a curved approach coming around, you measure along the center of the lane along the curve. Right. It's not a straight line in that case. In this case, the road is straight, so you're measuring straight down the center of that lane. So that's this, this D1 and D2 is from this equation. Right. Based on what vehicle you have and what movement you're doing, it changes this T sub G that you're going to plug in here. But this is the speed on the major road, and then this is the, uh, this is the conversion, actually, to feet per second. And then ISD turns out in feet. This is the unit we're going to use for that, right? So we're measuring along the major road. It's the design speed of the major road. We don't care what the speed on the minor road is because you stopped. <laughs> Your speed is zero when you start off, right, no, through there. And then you just change what that time value is. And that's why back here we're adjusting that time value because adjusting that time value, you plug it in this equation, it gives you a longer distance. And that's how we make that adjustment. Yep. So then... Uh, this this case one right this is uh, case b part one or b1 is turning left onto the major road so the the time gaps um this should say don't uh, don't matter of course to the minor road they do matter uh, along the major road um you assume that we also assume though that might major road drivers are going to when they see someone pulling out they're going to let off their gas a little bit right so it's not that the major road drivers continue at 55 all the way through they're actually typically will slow down a little bit and the idea is we don't want people to uh, on the major road to have to slow down more than about 15 percent of whatever the main line speed is at the time so people will you don't want them to have to have to slow down too much because that becomes dangerous if they're not paying attention right and then we have to apply these corrections for this time gap in for multiple highways and for any grade on that minor road approach that's going to slow you down from taking off right and if the median is wide enough to accommodate your vehicle so if it's a passenger car with three foot of clearance on either side right so how long is a passenger car all right we say it's 20 feet and so if you've got at least 26 feet in the median, then you can use the median to stop in and wait. And so in that case, turning left on to the major road or crossing the major road, we actually, um, you can uh, break it into pieces. And the road car from the minor road is just crossing the uh, the first half of the road, I guess, waiting in the median, then we'll cross the second half. And so you can use, you don't have to use that entire width then in your calculation, which helps out a lot. You need less, obviously less sight distance if you're not crossing all four lanes plus the median in one shot right through there. And so in, in that case, um, because that left turn movement, you, the first one is you're just crossing two lanes and waiting in the median you're just checking to make sure you can safely cross those first two lanes and then you're turning left from that um, the median you're not uh, you don't have to add in all that extra time to cross through the median and extra lanes it's it's returns back to more like that base case where you're on a two-lane highway and turning left on to that and so what you do is if you check for a distance for the right turn movement, that's going to give you enough time to get uh, across the first two lanes and get out into the median uh, through there. And so, but we do have to check for that left turn from the median onto the major road. And so you're kind of breaking into two intersections is what you're doing. The first one, you're just crossing a crossing maneuver, which is the right turn or the uh, approach from the right um, uh, timing. It's the same as doing a right turn movement uh, through there. And then once you're in the meeting, then you do the left turn from there. So you break it into two pieces right through that. So here's that stop control from the minor road again. And so this is, uh, this is for a right turn. This is case B2. So you're turning right onto the road. And if you're turning right, you only need to worry about cars coming from the left here. All right. You don't need to worry about anybody in this lane. And so it's a little simpler case. And so this is case B2. And so you're measuring this, and you're measuring this distance down the center of that approach lane as it comes in 
right there right through that so that's stop control on the minor road and then you're turning right onto that road all right so it's as similar as with the left turn um right turn drivers you usually don't give yourself as big enough as big a gap as if you were to turn left out into the road that's just human behavior um through there so we actually use um slightly shorter time gaps uh, than we did for the left turn case and so we, we use one second less uh, through that we still correct for grades but we only add 0.1 seconds on for each grade uh, through there and if you if we have inadequate sight distance, if you just don't have it, you can reduce the speed limit on the major road. Now you hope people obey that. That doesn't always work All right, through there, but that's one that's one coping strategy. If there is just no way to get appropriate sight distance, there's a building in the way. You can't buy the building. If there's a uh, excuse me cliff or something, uh, that would be a case, right? And then our uh, final one, this case B three, is crossing all the way across the road. And so here we we stopped here, and now we're crossing the through here but we're not merging into traffic and turning left so it's actually a, we need less time than if we uh, merged and turned left to get shoot straight across right through there so you you tend not to take as big a gap as you would if you were to turn left all right that's the, we're actually the worst case typically through here but you do have to care about can i see cars from both directions you know obviously through there through that and what we find is if you check case B1 and B2, it, there's almost it's almost always fine for case B3, right? The only place it wouldn't be is if you had more than two lanes you're crossing or you've got a median or you've got a really steep uh, grade maybe in here. All that affects um, both kind of similarly through there. It's typically if you, only if you have a really long crossing would the crossing maneuver actually not be covered by case B1 and B2, right, through there. So the, and what we normally do is we check at crossing, we reuse that B2 gap uh, for that. And so the, the places where we would definitely just check it and, um, and assume that we have to check it is where you, the only thing you can do is cross over, where you no left, no turns onto the main road are allowed. Well, that means you probably wouldn't have checked case B1 and B2 already. So yes, you're going to check it now um, through there. If if that whole width, the medians and extra lanes you're crossing is the equivalent of six lanes or, or more, then you definitely need to check your the cross maneuver uh, through there because it's going to make a big difference in that. And if you have a, a substantial number of heavy vehicles or the steep grades on that approach where you stopped, then you're going to need to check that, that crossing maneuver. And those are special cases to be, to be careful of. If it's a standard one, if you already checked B1 and B2, it's more than likely you're fine on the crossing maneuver. All right, through there. KC, we don't use very often anymore is yield control. We do have still some yield signs, but really on any kind of state highway or federal highway project, you're not going to allow yield signs on the minor road. At least I don't know any states that, that do that anymore. This would be um, two local roads where they cross, one's major and one's minor. You might still have yield uh, control through there. It's a similar procedure, except now you need your decision points way back here. All right, and because as you approach, you have to decide: Am I going to stop or not? Right? Am I going to yield or not to uh, to a car on the major road? I have to be able to see the car on the major road to know if I need to stop uh, through there. Here's what the KC times uh, uh, your values are for that. Right, and so that's uh, for whatever speed you're going. Then you have to adjust. Here's the minor road approach leg, and then here is that travel time. Uh, calculation times the um, uh, speed on the major road. So this would be your major road distance back here. Right? So here's the B case, here's the A case, here's the A, uh, and here's the B uh, situation through that, right? Through there. So that's what we're, we're looking at there. And so that's giving us time to decide whether we need to stop or not through that. So in the field, uh, how do you measure, how do you, how would you measure this? And so this often comes up um, if you work for a highway agency is someone says, well, what is the current intersection site distance at this location? And how do you measure that and go out and double check it? All right. 
do there. It's maybe a little easier in a design situation if it's a brand new uh, approach on a brand new major road highway. But a lot of times you're retrofitting, you're putting a driveway in, a new driveway on an existing road that you don't have survey on or not very good survey. Uh, it's often just a lot easier to measure it in the field. So uh, the first thing, if you're going to measure this in the field, this is a survey lath. They're just laying around usually, so you just grab one. could be any stick or a rod that you've got. You're just going to mark three and a half feet. So here we marked three and a half feet. This is what we're going to set our eye next to. So we make sure our eye is three and a half feet off the ground. It's easier to use a lath and mark it than it is just to hold the tape measure next to your eye because, you know, um, you can lean on the lath and it's not going to fold up on you like the tape measure would. So usually I just uh, mark the lath with that. All right, so we mark that lath at three and a half feet. Then uh, we had a special sign made because as you know, a lot of times these sight distances are six or 700 feet and down the road. It is really hard to see that far and to a small object. So we made this object sign and we set this line right here in the center to be exactly at three and a half feet above the ground. So between the bottom of the, this is a sign post, between the bottom of that post and this line is three and a half feet. All right. And with different colors, you can see easily, okay, I can't see orange anymore. Once the orange is completely obscured and can't be seen, I know that I'm, I have reached my sight distance. And that's, the, that's that three and a half foot level. So anything past that point, once I can't see that, if it's over the top of a hill, I'll say, okay, that's that's the limit as, as far as I can see. So here we set it up. Here's a driveway. That's a little driveway there. And then we've got the object sign or that we're referencing is going down the street away from us, right? We set our eye next to this three and a half foot elevation. And then this, this person, whoever the observer is, is watching the person holding the object sign as they, um, she'll just be backing up going down this road until... Either, like in this case, the car will obscure them or a building, or you'll go over the top of a hill. Or maybe, you know, you get a thousand feet down the road and you can still see it. Like, well, that's way farther than we ever need. So we say, yeah, we've got adequate sight distance. No point in measuring further than that because it's bigger than any distance we need. All right, through there. So that center, this dividing line on the sign is at three and a half feet above the ground. And again, as this sign moves back down the center of that approach lane, Right, we're gonna see when we can't see orange anymore, and that's when we get that. Or at this point, where we, our eyes position is 14 and a half feet from the edge of the road, and this is from the edge of the travel lane. If this was a shoulder, you wouldn't count that in that 14. You'd measure out to the travel lane through there, because this is this is the um, out here in the road is where you'd actually meet a car who's approaching, and you'd be able to see it. All right, so that's how we set it up, and then this sign just keeps getting walked back. This object sign gets walked back up the road until you either you can't see the orange anymore, that dividing line on it. And that's how you know when you've reached the end in your sight distance. So there's there's sight distance. We've got an in-class to work on this and some homework uh, coming up. Again, this is a pretty major deal, a big design check. Um, before you submit any design as final, you're going to make sure you go through these intersection sight distance uh, calcs and and verify that you've got this because this is i've um, seen this come up into legal disputes in the past where someone designed an off-ramp with a, a retaining wall even and didn't have quite the adequate sight distance. it wasn't off by a lot but it was off and that is um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a change order that the designer had to pay you know to fix it because it was a retaining wall right it was hard to fix uh, through there and that's on the designer right that, that's your job and if you're designing this, is to do it right and make sure you've got the required side distance. Okay, uh, next time we'll be moving on with uh, other types of intersections and moving into roundabouts.